Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Welcome to the Spring 2019 LS Squared Lecture. My name is Dr. Carrie Kebaugh, and I'm a co-founder of the LS Squared series. Uh, for those of you who may be new to the lecture series, welcome. Our lecture is designed to promote dialogue about topics relevant to the liberal arts disciplines. This series is a forum for the exchange and dissemination of ideas, a place to celebrate faculty projects and research, and a way to reach out and share our work with both the NSCC family and the broader community of which the college is part. And to those of you who have been here before, welcome back. If you're interested in being considered to be the speaker for future lectures, please be on the lookout for an upcoming CFP, Call for Papers. If you're interested in viewing any of our previous lectures, those are available now online at our Google Sites, and the backslash is LS2. So the full URL would be sites.google.com backslash northshore.edu backslash LS2. And now I'd like to turn the lectern over to my colleague and the other LS Squared co-founder, Dr. Kara Kaufman, who will introduce us to today's speaker. Hello. So I'd like to introduce um, today's speaker. A lot of people already know him. Um, he is Dr. Fred Altieri, and he's been teaching at North Shore since 2006. His courses include Introduction to Philosophy, Ethics, environmental ethics, medical ethics, and honors seminars on the meaning of life and the human genome. Dr. Altieri also serves as advisor to Phi Theta Kappa, an international honors society with a chapter here at North Shore, and is a past recipient of the NISOD Award for Teaching Excellence. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Coffin. Thank you all, all four of you, for coming out. <laughs> I know. We originally scheduled, and then there was snow and all sorts of things. So today I'm going to be talking about perception. And some of you have been in my class, you've taken my class. Some of you are actually in the class that this was scheduled as a lecture for, so some of this will seem very, very familiar. Still, I hope that you uh, gain some insight into the nature of perception and the relationship between perception and our conceptions of reality. Our senses are the window to the world, seeing, hearing, tasting, and so forth. And so when we investigate the relationship between perception and the world, we might learn some things about reality that we didn't actually expect. Now, one thing that Dr. Kaufman didn't mention, and I don't know why she would have because I don't think she knows this, but my favorite color is blue. That's who I am. So some of you may think that uh, blue is the best color. I think this is close to my, my ideal shade of blue. And when I say blue is my favorite color, I'm talking about the, the feeling I get from seeing blue, the perceptual experience, the, the qualia, if you will, of the, the, the color blue. It's what I see that maybe someone who's colorblind cannot perceive. And that is what we see in the world. So let's talk about sight, which is arguably the most important human sense. But what I say about sight will also apply to other senses, such as taste, touch. In fact, it applies to all of them. So let's take an object like an apple. Now what do we see? Normally we would say we see the apple, right? We look at this thing, we say, oh, I see an apple. But that's actually not what's going on. What you see, what you perceive, is your brain's reconstruction of the apple. Our experience of the world is mediated through many neurophysiological processes, which we're gonna sort of summarize later on. And what we perceive is what our brain says it, the world is like. And so we don't actually perceive objects directly, we perceive our brain's perception or our brain's reconstruction of the object. That's known as the representative theory of per perception, for those of you following at home, checking off your boxes. We don't perceive, right, you got their box score. We don't perceive the object itself, we perceive our brain's representation. So the reality of perception is more like this. We don't see the object, we don't know what's out there. We only know what our mind's eye tells us is out there. And so the question then becomes, did our brain get it right? How do we know that what we perceive is anything like the real world? How do we know that our brain got the color right or the shape or the texture or any of that? Now we feel like it did. We feel like everything we perceive is real, but we cannot be sure about that. We feel a lot of things that aren't necessarily true. So let's talk about sight and how it works and We'll take it from there. So first of all, you have an object, and light bounces off the object and reflects a certain color. So if the object is red, 
the surface of the object absorbs every single color except red, and the red is thrown off, and we say the object is red. Now, one could make a case that the object is actually every single color except red, so our perception of the object is exactly the opposite of what reality is. Now, you might think that's a little semantically frivolous and not buy that argument, that when we say it's red, we mean what color's thrown off. That's fair enough. But I do want to point out that what comes off of that object is not an apple. It, it is light waves. These are light waves that come off the apple and at best represent data about the apple. So already we're one step removed from the object of perception. Now, when these light waves enter our eyeball, the lens inverts it onto the back of our retina. I don't know if you know this, but the image that's projected onto the back of our eyes is a flip. It's an inverse of the image. So you're actually perceiving things upside down, and then your brain, allegedly, writes it later on in the process. So you see some object, this information is inverted onto the retina, and then the information travels down the optic nerve to the back of the brain, the occipital lobe, which is where the visual cortex processes this information and then we see the image or we perceive the image. But this optic nerve is not like fiber optic cable. It's not a tube that goes from our eyes to the back of our head. There are a number of steps in between and at each step there's an opportunity for error to creep in. So if we could briefly have a neurophysiological inter interlude, if such a thing could be brief, our cells, our neurons, don't actually touch each other. They connect at a synapse, which is a small space in between the neurons. And when one talks to the other, or connects to the other, it releases neurotransmitters that then move across the synaptic cleft and bind with the postsynaptic membrane and then encourage the target neuron to fire. Um, these little neurotransmitter molecules are things like acetylcholine and dopamine and serotonin, and there's a whole bunch of them. But what they are is not as important as what they aren't, because they aren't apples. Now, again, that sounds frivolous, but remember, this is a different language now. We've got light waves, now we have acetylcholine et al. And the information somehow is supposed to be consistent. We're supposed to get an accurate representation of what we see. Now, once these neurotransmitters bind with the postsynaptic membrane, they don't travel down the target neuron and then repeat the process. It's not, again, um, a tube or a, a fiber optic cable. What happens is our cells, imagine it's a tube that's perforated, and there are a number of channels, these gates, that allow ions to pass back and forth. These ions, like uh, potassium, sodium, whatever, these are charged particles. And if you have enough of the positives inside or outside the cell, then there's a polarity difference across the membrane. It's like a magnet. And if that magnet gets strong enough, that causes the next set of gates to open, which allows particles to go in and out, which then reverses the polarity. And when that gets strong enough, the next set of gates opens, and so on and so forth. And so this polarity difference, this action potential, if you will, propagates down the neuron until it reaches the end, and then neurotransmitters, then back into this propagation, and so on. So your neurons, imagine, are like a hotel. So think of a hotel party. You've got a long hallway and then there's a bunch of doors. And if there's a party in there, a bunch of people might be in, in the hallway, and it starts to reach a critical mass when there's too many people. So they spill out into the, the rooms on the side, and then the people in the rooms are like, where'd all these people come from? We better get out of here. They go back into the hall. The people at that side of the hall say, oh my God, where are these people coming from? They open the next set of doors, and so on. So it's like chunk, 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 all the way down the length of your cell. So your information about the apple translates from light waves to acetylcholine and other neurotransmitters to sodium and calcium ions back into the first language, back and forth, back and forth, hundreds, thousands, perhaps millions of times. It's like a telephone game. Have you ever played the telephone game at a party, right? Where one person has a message, you whisper it in their ear, they whisper it in the next ear, and then by the time it comes out the other side, the message has been distorted. It's not the same message as it was before. So, how do we know that the information about the apple was accurately represented into our mind's eye. How do we know that this is not the reality? Now you might say, well, why would my brain lie to me? We've been together so long. <laughs> We're so close, right? And yet, your brain does lie to you. Your brain is a liar. So get out those divorce papers, because I'm gonna prove it to you. Now everybody on their chair should have one of these. You see, where the optic nerve connects to the retina 
there's no visual information getting transmitted to the visual cortex. There's just no visual information about that visual field, which means every eyeball has a blind spot. Now, you don't notice this, partially because two eyes, they cancel each other out, they give you information. But if you close one eye, you don't see the blind spot because your brain is making up some information. So if you take this, and you can do it to the left or the right, but I like to do it to the left. So if you hold this out, and make sure the line is even with the line of your eyes. So if you hold the X to the left, and then you close your left eye, with your right eye, stare at the X. Do not take your right eye off of the X, but slowly move the paper closer and farther, and you will see that dot disappear. As long as your left eye is closed and the X is to the left, and you keep your right eye fixed on that X, but you notice the dot, it will disappear at a certain point. Now, did everybody see that? Everybody, right? That's crazy. That's because you have a blind spot, and your brain didn't tell you about it. But it gets even worse. So what you should do now, take this, this blind spot. So move it back and forth until the dot disappears, and hold it in your blind spot. So you can't see the dot, right? But can you see the line that's behind the dot? Can everybody see that? How can you see the line behind the dot? Your brain is not getting any information about that line because there's a dot in front of it. So what's going on there? Well, first of all, it's bad enough that your brain is not telling you that anything's going on. It's like when you see an accident and you walk by and the cops are like, nothing to see here, keep it moving, keep it moving. Your brain doesn't tell you. But the fact that your brain tells you there's a line back there means that your brain is actively lying to you, is telling you that it has information which it does not because your brain will take the pattern around the blind spot and fill it in and say, yeah, this must be what it is. Your brain is completely fudging the numbers. And this is just an X and a, and a, and a Y, or a, an X and a dot. This is just a piece of paper that proved to you that your brain is not being accurate. So if it's wrong about the dot, if it's wrong about the line behind the dot, what else is your brain lying to you about? What color actually is the apple? So one of the historical philosophers that we talk about in my class <clears throat> is John Locke. Um, you probably, those of you who don't take intro, probably know him more as a political philosopher. Um, he said that God gave us the rights to life, liberty, and property, and this is a very, very famous quote. But he was also an epistemologist, and even though he didn't know anything about acetylcholine or other neurotransmitters or any of that, he did conceive of these possibilities. And one of his most famous thought experiments is known as the inverted spectrum. So it's inverted because it's flipped, and it's a spectrum because it's a color bar. So imagine two individuals, A and B. Now they each have a mind's eye. They each have something that they perceive within their mind. And in between A and B, we will put two objects. Now we will, for a while, have the God's eye view. We're gonna know what reality is to make the point about the inverted spectrum. So we have red cherries and green apples. Now, for the record, Locke's examples were marigolds and violets, and I couldn't find any clip art for those very specific flowers. Marigolds and violets, right? So I'm gonna use cherries, and a plus in my lectures, I write them on the board, and I'm not drawing a marigold. That's not gonna happen. So we'll use green apples and red cherries. Okay, so A, we'll call A normal. And A sees the cherries on the left as red, and the apple on the right as green. But B has an inverted spectrum. B sees the cherries as what A would call green, and B sees the apple as what A would call red. They perceive the world in opposite ways. But here's the question. Would they ever know that they perceive the world in different ways? Can they tell? Now, if I ask a colorblind person or a red-green colorblind person, can you tell the difference between those two colors? And, mean, and they would say, mean those two identically gray fruits? Obviously, I see a difference between those two fruits. They don't. We know that we see the world in different ways. But A and B say, oh, yes, the apples and the cherries are of different colors. The cherries are red and the apples are green. Now, why is that? It's because both of these individuals speak the same language. And we'll use English as our example. In English, apples are green or cherries are red or whatever it is, is a true statement. And so when they were children, they were taught Cherries are red, that's what you call the color red. And since A and B both speak the same language, they both call the color they perceive of cherries red. So A perceives the cherries that way, calls it red. B perceives the cherries that way and calls it red. Now it doesn't matter if it's rouge or roja or aca or any, it doesn't matter what sound you use to describe this color. It's the same thing in the same language. They both use the same word. But if I put a stop sign in between them and say what color is the stop sign, they're both gonna say the stop sign is red. 
because A perceives it of the color of cherries, and cherries are red, therefore stop signs are red, B also perceives it as the color of cherries, which B perceives like that, which B calls red. So everybody will agree that stop signs are red, but they don't know that they perceive the world in different ways. And this is another way of calling into question the relationship between our perception of the world and the reality of the world. We don't even know if we perceive the world in the same way that other people perceive it, let alone whether we perceived it accurately. And now to take away that God's eye view, I mean, I put these things in the middle to make the point, but really, this is where we live. We live in our own mind. And if A has this experience and B has this experience, the question is, what color is the flower? Is there any way to know what color that flower is? No. So this calls the meaning of our very words into, into question. What does the word red mean? If you're B, what does the word red mean? It means that. If you're A, the, the word red means something different. It means the quality, it means the experience. And so when I tell you that my favorite color is blue, do you have any idea what I was talking about? Does anybody know what my favorite color really is? I mean, it's not a series of sentences. The sky is blue, the ocean is blue, blue jeans are blue. I'm not like, oh, I love the way those sentences look. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, the, the perceptual experience of blue. And if you don't know what the word blue means, if you don't know whether the sky is actually blue, what is reality? And this is not just true of color. It's cr true of taste, it's true of hot and cold, it's true of justice, it's true of beauty. You might think of something that's beautiful, something everybody considers beautiful. And that's true. Let's not deny it. Now, we all say this is an amazingly beautiful thing. We love this guy, right? But how do we know what Ryan Reynolds really looks like? Maybe he looks like that. Now, this is crazy. This is, this is an inverted spectrum, but this is creepy looking. If this thing came to your house at night, you would want to kill it with a spear. This is the undead, right? I mean, if this comes to your house at night, <laughs> yay. But this is creepy, but we really don't know what the world is really like. So how accurate are our perceptions, and what does this mean about reality? Okay. So John Locke gave us some vocabulary to help sort of pick through these, these, these questions and maybe answer some of them. The difference between primary and secondary qualities. Now, some of you have already taken notes on this, and you've already taken the test on this, so you don't have to. Primary qualities are the real properties of the world. These are what the world really is like. And our perceptions of the primary qualities resemble the properties in the world. So, for example, if blue is a primary quality, if color is a primary quality, which, spoiler alert, John Locke doesn't think it is. But if it were, then the sky would actually be blue, and my perception of the blueness of the sky would be what it's really like in the real world. Secondary qualities exist only in the mind. They are perceptions that we perceive but aren't accurate. They do not resemble the properties in the world. Color is a, primary, uh, is a primary example of a secondary quality. Sorry about that. It's an iconic example of a secondary quality because the colors people perceive are different. Some people are colorblind, and we know this. We know they perceive a different color by looking at the same object. So what are the primary and what are the secondary qualities? Now, for Locke, most primaries are secondary, and there's a lot of ways he gets at it, but I'm just going to summarize and give you the list. According to Locke, there are only five primary qualities. In other words, the universe is only composed of five basic properties. Size, shape, state, or um, solidity, the texture of something, motion, and number. Are things moving? How big are they? What are they, they, their, their sizes, and so forth? Everything else is a secondary quality. From taste, to sound, to beauty, to justice, all of it exists only in the mind. So John Locke's version of reality is of a number of colorless, silent objects all moving through space. And that's as best that I could do for, to represent uh, such a thing. They're not moving. The idea is all the things we take to give life its flavor, the colors, the taste, the, 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 the enjoyment, the joy, whatever it is, these all exist only in our mind. That's not what the world is really like. Now, that's bad enough to imagine that there's no such thing as color, that everything, or not everything, but most of the things we perceived about reality, those squares aren't yellow, those chairs aren't red, and so forth. They're not real properties of the world. It's like our brain is on some sort of psychotropic drug. But other philosophers thought that maybe John Locke didn't take his argument to its logical conclusion. One such philosopher was George Berkeley, who agreed with Locke that all knowledge comes from perception, that we perceive the concepts in our mind, the ideas in our mind's eye. 
But whereas Locke said that these are these five primary qualities, Berkeley questioned whether or not we could even draw that conclusion. Now, he had many arguments, and again, here's one that people have taken a test on. But basically, it, it goes like this. If the qualities you can perceive of an object change without the object changing, that must mean that the, the, the property does not exist in the object itself, the color, the taste, the whatever. It only exists in the mind. And he had a number of examples. Um, one famous one is of three bowls of water. So imagine three bowls of water. One's hot, one's cold, and one's just right. So you put your one hand in the hot, one hand in the cold, and you leave them there for a while. Then you take both hands out and you put them in the middle water, in the mild water. Is that water going to feel hot or cold? Well, the water is going to feel hot to the hand that was in the cold water and cold to the hand that was in the hot water. So the water feels both hot and cold, but the water itself cannot be both hot and cold. That's impossible. Thus, hot and cold only exist in the mind. And this works for all so sorts of things where the thing itself remains the same, but our perceptions of the thing itself change. Have you guys ever drank some orange juice, and then you go and you brush your teeth, and then you drink the rest of the orange juice and it tastes terrible, right? This is not because of the orange juice. The orange juice didn't go rancid in the five minutes it took you to drink it. It's that your perception changed. So taste is also a secondary quality, meaning taste exists only in the mind. So let's look at Locke's list of primary qualities, size, shape, state, motion, and number. Barclay, one step at a time, goes through each and asks, can these perceived qualities change without the object itself changing? So let's start with size. Well, it seems that size can change. I mean, that bird is not half the size of the moon. That's an illusion. But our perception of size can change based on our perspective. If we're very small, blades of grass look very big, and so on and so forth. So size is a secondary quality. What about shape? Now I gotta see if I can make the, this work. Oops. Well, you guys see that shape change? Pretty cool, huh? That was some street art. And, okay. Pretty cool, right? The shape of that thing changed based on your perspective. And the shape of everything changes based on our perspective, based on our angle. Um, of approach, as it were. And so shape actually depends upon our, uh, something in our mind, not in reality, which means shape is a secondary quality, so not shape. What about state? What about solidity or texture? Well, this is baby powder, and it looks pretty dangerous, <laughs> right? Um, interesting anecdote, when my bug guy came to spray for carpenter bees that were you know, destroying my porch, he sprayed this powder in there, and now I'm thinking, am I gonna die? Is this chemical, what's going on? And he said, no, 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 he's like, it's, it's perfectly harmless. It's just that to us, because we're big, it feels like powder, but to the bees, because they're smaller, it feels like glass. It's like broken glass that they're stepping on. So they go in there, they don't wanna, and then they leave immediately because it's very scary to bees. But to us, it's like baby powder. So the texture of something depends upon one's perspective as well. State is a secondary quality. You see where this is going, right? What about motion? Well. You've been driving down the highway at 80 miles an hour, maybe, maybe not, maybe I have. But if someone else is driving at 80, you can, you, know, you can have a conversation with that person. You shouldn't, but you could, because you're moving at the same speed, it looks like you're not moving. Or have you ever had that experience, and this one's fun, where you're at a stoplight and there's a bus next to you, and then the bus slowly starts pulling forward and you feel like you're going backwards and you slam on the brakes? Right, that's, that's always a larf. Because motion is perspective. And right now, we're moving in how many different directions? The Earth is spinning at 25,000 miles an hour. We don't feel it. We're moving through the solar system, through the galaxy, through the universe. Continental drift, that's moving. We don't feel continental drift either. So motion is relative to observer. So motion is secondary. Come on, number, you can do it. But number doesn't work either. I mean. Sometimes I'm fond of telling people, you know, if you get drunk and you see double, <laughs> but you shouldn't, that's not what I'm gonna, that, now this is on camera, sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> this is an illusion that we don't quite know why it works, but you can't see all of the dots at the same time. How many are there? You can't perceive them. Sometimes you can perceive two or three, or some people can get four. I don't know how many dots you can see at once. Is it working up there in the screen? Yes, it is. No matter how big the thing is, this thing still works. How many dots are there? So it turns out, even number is a secondary quality. So all qualities are secondary qualities. 
That means all qualities exist only in the mind. That means there is no such thing as external reality. There's only the reality that we perceive. And this is known as metaphysical idealism, the theory that all qualities are secondary, everything exists just as a perception in the mind, and matter is an illusion. So those chairs you're sitting on right now, you feel like they're solid matter. But think about what I said. You feel like they're solid matter. That's just a perception. You don't have any evidence that such a thing is real any more than you have an evidence that those things are really yellow or a, a violet is really purple. Everything you know about the world comes from a perception and all perceptions exist only in the mind. Therefore, the entire universe exists only in your mind. There's no such thing. Even your body, the physical fingers you have, you feel them, you see them, you can hear them. Your perception of your own body is secondary. And so we are pure thought. We are pure mind, pure soul, if you will. And all the things we perceive are just a series of perceptions. Now you say, well, no, no, that's cuckoo banana pants. That's crazy. Of course this chair is real. Now, first of all, Barclay is not saying that the chair is not real. Barclay is saying that the nature of the reality of the chair is not what you think, but the chair is definitely real. He says, to be is to be perceived. Existence is perception. So the chair is simply a collection of perceptions in your mind. And if you say, no, no, but there's definitely a chair behind my perceptions, you have no evidence of that. That's like if we're driving down some country lane and out in the field I see a billboard. And on the billboard there's a picture of a barn. And I say to you, oh, there's a barn out in that field. And you're like, oh, no, 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 wait, you, you're driving, maybe you can't see. That's not a barn, that's a billboard with a picture of a barn on it. And then I say to you, oh, I know that's a billboard, and I know there's a picture of a barn on it. But what you don't know is that behind that billboard, we can't see it, but behind that billboard is an identical barn to the one that's on the billboard. You can't perceive it, but it's exactly like that one, but it's behind there. What would you say to me? You would say, no, no, man, that's just, there. why, you're just making that up. But when you tell me that there's a chair Behind your perception of the chair, you're doing the same thing. Nothing exists except what we perceive. And this leads us to arguably the most famous philosophical question of all. If a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around to hear it, right? You laugh because you've heard it. I always hear it. Whenever I go to dinner parties and people find out what I do for a living, they always ask me this question. <laughs> right? We've all got one. And they say if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? But the answer is this, if existence is just perception, and there's no such thing outside of perceptions, and you can't have a perception without a perceiver, then if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around to hear it, the tree does not exist. There is no tree. There was never a tree in the first place because there was no perceiver for the tree to exist. So there is no external world. There is only thought. You are pure soul. And everything we perceive is real, but it is not physical matter. Now, I don't want to talk too much about God or whatever. We could, um, but whatever you think of as your conception of God, God must be the one who maintains our reality, who thinks of these things. Because when you perceive that tree and you see it fall, it fell, and then you leave, the tree no longer exists because the tree is gone. But then when you come back, the tree is still there. Who is perceiving that tree the whole time? That's God. When you see your fingers are not, they're just images in your mind. They are perceptions. They're not physical things. But if you can daydream and imagine your fingers shooting lightning bolts, how come you can't do that with these fingers? Because God is maintaining the integrity of your fingers right now by thinking about it. Those chairs that you're sitting in, you can imagine falling through them, but you can't actually, because God is now thinking of those chairs right now. And because God's mind is so much more powerful than ours, when we touch one of God's ideas, it feels real. And so you are now touching one of God's ideas. We are existing within this building, which is one of God's ideas. So when someone says, I see God in every tree and every rock and every flower, and like, ah, shut up, you hippie. But this is what Barclay is saying. This is what seeing is believing leads us to, is to the conclusion that everything exists only in the mind, and the only way we can make sense of the integrity and consistency of the world is by positing another mind that maintains this world for us. And so that 
is the nature of reality. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank oh, thank you very much. Yeah. That's very nice of you. So again, this was an abbreviated version of a lecture I gave, and I didn't want to take too much time, so I hope I didn't, and I hope I didn't take too little time. Is that about right? Because I know you wanted some, some Q&A time. So if anybody has any questions about, you know, the nature of reality, <laughs> let me know. Don't feel like you have to. I mean, I, I know saw some of you are like, oh my God, what did he just do to us? Yes. Making, I'm sorry. Hi. Did anybody uh, thought of making a mind primary since, well, there's only mind and everything that kind of thought? Uh, so, yes. Yeah, so, the, well, the mind, I mean, if we define the mind as, uh, or if we define a primary quality as something that exists only in the mind, then obviously a mind can't be within itself. But I, I know what you mean, that the mind is a primary substance. This is the one thing that's real. And Berkeley agrees with this. Descartes agreed with this. When Descartes said, I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum, it was his argument that the mind is the one thing you can know with certainty. The body could be an illusion. We don't know, but the mind is a certainty. So for even Berkeley, who thinks everything exists only in the mind, he has to posit the reality of the mind in order for there to be a perception, right? No perceptions without perceivers. I clearly perceive things, ergo I clearly have a mind. So in that sense, the mind is a substance, as is God's mind, just a greater, more powerful substance than ours. Did that answer the question? <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, uh, so there's, uh, I, I'd be happy to answer it, but I'm, you might not agree with the question or with the answer, and that's different than not understanding the question. Um, maybe I didn't un or, or understand the answer. Maybe I didn't understand the question. Uh, then I'll take that as partial credit. Yes. This was fascinating. Oh, well, thank you. Um, so, okay, so currently I am taking a course and one of the things that we're studying is Jung and archetypes. So talking about how, and, the, and I think Bill Moyers did this, you know, um, a special on this, that across cultures and across generations, there are themes or motifs or whatever that keep showing up, like the journey of a hero, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, fairy tales. You can go to every single continent and they'll have a a similar fairy tale about um, a, a child venturing off into the wilderness, and the wilderness will change depending on the landscape. Right. You know, um, in, in, an, in the Arctic, it would be into the tundra. It would be the jungle in South America, or if you're like in Grimm's fairy tale land, it would be an alpine forest. So how would this explain that across cultures, there are these weird, like, archetypal similarities, like in a fairy tale or for like a lot of cultures, um, black has been associated with death, or in, in some cultures, white. Or how 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 would this explain things that seem to keep popping up, to, separate from people's experience or time? Right, that's a good question because one of the objections is if we all share a similar experience, especially separated by space and time, how can there be similarity if something is just a perception of the mind? All the perceivers die, the perceptions dies with them, and okay. Um, and that's why Berkeley has to posit the existence of, of an infinite God to maintain the integrity of this world. So God, for example, might have in his or her or its whatever mind this concept of the hero's journey or the wilderness or um, even an archetype as simple as mother or uh, warrior or something like that. And because it's in God's mind and because God is maintaining the integrity of this universe, every mind that comes in contact with God will also come in contact with these archetypes. But because we have our own minds and we have our own way of doing things and we can maybe disagree with God or whatever, and to the extent that God allows us to disagree with them, perhaps we manifest these ideas, these things we perceive in different ways. So it's the universal is explained by a singular God that exists at all times. And perhaps for God, there's no such thing as time. For us though, there is. Um, but this God exists at all times and, and, and places, whereas the rest of us who are separated spatiotemporally might manifest it in different ways. Maybe like the 13 blind men and the elephant, perhaps. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a, th an elephant goes to the village, 13 blind men feel different parts of the elephant. One has the trunk, one has the leg, one has the tail, the ear, or something. 
And then when everybody comes back, they try and explain what they saw. One thinks he had a pillar, one thinks he had a rope, one thinks he had a snake, and they all, of course, argue over what the nature of the thing was, but that's a metaphor for the nature of God, that all the different religions have different aspects of the divine, or not even religions, but different access points to the spiritual, whatever that might be. And so we see different aspects of it, but it's one aspect. So perhaps, now I'm theorizing, Barclay didn't talk about Jung, obviously, but that's how I would see that relating to this. Um, whoa, <laughs> that's loud. <laughs> so um, you said that like physical things can be like a perception of the mind. Well, not only can they, but they are. Okay, so for instance, like right now, I'm looking at Professor Kaufman, um, and he also sees her, he sees her, she sees her, you see her. So how is that a perception of the mind if we're all seeing the same woman standing there looking the exact same? Like we can all agree that like she has on black leggings, a purple shirt, black, really cute shoes. Um, <laughs> we can all see that. We all have that exact same perception of her. So how is that a perception of the mind if we are all seeing the exact same thing? Let's say that like we see a video of like a tree falling, for instance. We see a video like of a real live tree falling um, and we all see the exact same thing. How is that a perception? So that's a fair question. Now, when describing Dr. Kaufman, um, some of the things I agree, she might be wearing leggings or she might be a certain height or a certain distance away from whatever, but when you say she's wearing a purple shirt, what do you mean by the word purple? Well, the color that you see, right. So let me see if I have way back here in this, I got a lot of slides in this thing. Well, that's the thing. So we all use the same word. We say she's wearing a purple, but we perceive things differently. So. That would be the answer there. We don't perceive things the same way. On the other hand, she is standing there, right? And she has a certain relationship, spatio-temporal relationship. The explanation would be that God is perceiving this room. And so God perceives the distance between the room. And so to the extent that we all perceive things in exactly the same way, it's because we are coming in contact with one of God's perceptions. And we cannot help but perceive things the way God wants us to perceive. Well, you kind of have to, though. Right? So think about this. Well, right. So consider this. We went from, well, yes, but where did this theory go wrong is the question. So you have a perception. We perceive our mind. We don't know what our mind actually perceives. And every property of the universe could change based on our perspective. This leads us to metaphysical idealism, that everything exists just as a perception of the mind. Again, when you say there's an external world, you have to prove to me that there's a barn behind that, that billboard of the barn. And that's just, the best argument you can give for that is that it's too weird if there isn't a barn there. But that's not an argument, right? That's just, you really want it to be true, but I really want to eat all the Big Macs I can. And, you know, like when I was 21, I want to go back to that era, but that's not good for me. So simply wanting something to be the case doesn't prove it. So all we are allowed to believe in is our own perceptions. Now this has certain questions, like the one you're asking. How can we perceive the same thing? Look, these individuals, are perceiving something. Maybe they perceive the flowers of a different color, but there's something out there. So we must posit the existence of another mind. Now remember, we're only allowed to have minds and perceptions because anything else to perceive the physical world is an unwarranted assumption. And we know that other minds exist. We're having a conversation. We know that sometimes minds can put ideas in other minds. I can say Eiffel Tower, and you're, now you're thinking about the Eiffel Tower. We also know that some minds are more powerful than other minds. I could suggest a concept to you. I can say, imagine burning down the Eiffel Tower. And you would say, no, I'm not going to imagine that. I like the Eiffel Tower. So you can resist my mind. You won't imagine burning down the Eiffel Tower because your mind and my mind are of equal power because we're both humans. But have you ever taken a ball and you got a dog and you throw the ball, but you didn't throw the ball, and then the dog goes looking for the ball? You ever done that trick to a dog, right? That dog thinks the ball's out there. As far as the dog believes, that ball is out there. You have controlled that dog's mind because your mind is more powerful than a dog's mind. So we know that other minds exist. We know that there's a discrepancy in power between certain minds and that minds can put ideas in other minds. If you put all that together, it's not that much of a leap 
to assume that there's a, mi a mind that's more powerful than our mind by the same distance that our mind is more powerful than a dog's or than an oyster's or uh, carrots or something. And so, well, so that would be the explanation. So we get to metaphysical idealism because there's no way around it. And then we have this phenomenon of all of us perceiving the same thing. It's not really that hard to posit another mind. Now, when I say God, I don't necessarily mean Jesus Christ or Yahweh or anything like that. It's just a consciousness. And since that's not as crazy a thought as there being a barn behind a billboard of a barn that we can't see, then we have to take that as the possible explanation. So does that address your concern? I mean, I know you don't want to believe it. Again, I don't want to believe that Big Macs are going to, you know, angioplasty. So let's say that, like, I think there's an Eiffel Tower, but, like, you don't think there's one because you haven't seen that. Is that, like, you're, you perceiving that or, and me perceiving something else? Well, sometimes we perceive uh, different things. Um, I've never perceived something in your house, maybe, that you perceive every day. So to you, it's a real thing. To me, it doesn't exist. But you're telling me that it exists, and so when I hear this, this is an experience I have, and I can take your word for it or not. But if we both come upon an external object, which of course doesn't really exist, the reason we both agree that you know, those stairs, there's like one, two, three, four, five, six stairs or something like that, is because God is now thinking about that right now. And so when we both come in contact with God's mind, we can't help but perceive things the way God wants us to perceive them. Any more than that dog can help but think that the ball's down the, down the yard, even though it isn't. Well, you could be mistaken. I mean, I can think that... Pardon me? Oh, absolutely. I, I'm not, and I'm not even necessarily proving the existence of God per se. There's a lot of baggage that comes along with that word. Uh, right? Like, and you're all going to hell. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm simply pointing out that if we believe that seeing is believing, if we believe that what we perceive is reality, then we have to conclude that reality consists only in our perceptions because we don't perceive anything beyond reality. And that means that metaphysical idealism is true. We exist only in, in, as pure soul, pure thought. But this has certain problems. Namely, how can we perceive the same thing? Clearly, they're per those two individual perceivings. And we have to explain that, that phenomenon. We have to explain the data. One way is to posit the external world, but we have no evidence of that. We saw the problem with positing an external world. Is there another way to explain the data that doesn't cost us anything over and above the theory that we've already proven, namely metaphysical idealism? And that's why Berkeley concludes that there must be a cosmic mind, because he only has to posit the existence of another mind that is more powerful than his mind. And this is something we have evidence for already. So it's not too far of a leap, it's just an inference to the best explanation. Does that make sense? I mean, I know you don't want to believe in it. I don't even want to believe in it. No, that's not true. Uh, we do have some other questions, so if oh. you guys don't mind. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. I get caught up in discussions. It's occupational hazard. Hello. Uh, oh, sorry. there we are. So. When you say God in, your, um, in this context, do you use that as a description of the external reality beyond our perceptions and everything that that entails? Like just, just every, everything existing all at once beyond what we can perceive at any given time. So what are your thoughts? I would, I would have to say short answer, yes. Um, if by we, you only mean human minds or I don't know, Vulcan minds or whatever other minds are out there, whatever minds exist, if no, per, if no mind happens to be perceiving something at one time, like if there's no one around to hear that tree, then the tree doesn't exist. So one answer is the tree doesn't exist if no one's around to hear it. But another answer is the tree does make a sound because God hears it. Because even if we are not in a position to perceive it, God still perceives it, which is why when we go back to that forest, we'll see the tree has fallen in exactly the same spot that we see it every time we go on a hike. So from that perspective, yes, the God perceives everything that is perceived that humans or other lesser minds don't perceive, which almost sounds like a truism, but that's the best answer to that, that question I can give. Uh. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say, right? I know it's going to be dangerous. <laughs> okay. So, so the answer out of the conundrum of God is language. 
as as Wittgenstein posits, of course, right? Because the later Wittgenstein? Later Wittgenstein. Yes, okay. the bad Wittgenstein. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. No, we are not going to get into a discussion of the Tractatus here. It is irrelevant. It doesn't matter if the color is different until we start talking about that color. Because it's, it, it's only in the expression of it. So while we cannot objectively know if Kara's shirt is purple, we can have a shared language about purple that allows there to be a, a range of possible realities to which we all have access. So aubergine or eggplant or purple are three words for the same range of colors that if you've ever held an eggplant and you understand how the word and the object are connected, give you an out for God. So the answer to the question, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound, would be in the telling of that story, you have just made the sound. Well, okay. So, well, maybe. I don't know about that. Really? Um, I'm not an atheist in here. So it's true that we could use the same word for any range of experiences. And so in a sense, it doesn't really matter what they perceive as long as they stop at a stop sign, right? That's important, right? That's what we really care about. And so with respect to the color, and the color could be blue or plaid or any other perceptual experience that we use the same word to describe. The thing is that sometimes we feel that there is no range of possible experiences, that no matter how we might massage the language or try and use a different word or even conceive of something as only a duck and not a rabbit or whatever, in the end, we're still going to come upon a brick wall. We're gonna hit that wall and there's nothing we can do about it. There's something outside of us, right, that we have to bow to, if you will, epistemically. There's something that we cannot change based on anything we do. And in that, what Locke would call primary qualities or however you want to articulate it, that needs an explanation. That can't just be explained by language because regardless of what we call it, regardless of whether we have a word for it, regardless of whether we even have a concept of it, the Andromeda galaxy is, I don't know, 100 million light years away. Anybody know that? Whatever, we'll just say it's 100 million. That's a, that's a, a brute fact of the universe that even before we knew the Andromeda galaxy existed was still true, was it not? So language differences, you're right. And in a sense, it doesn't really matter. As long as we stop at stoplights, you call it what you want, you can perceive it any, any way you want. But if we don't stop at that stoplight, we're gonna get hit by a car and there's nothing we can do about that. So there's gotta be some extra mental reality that is consistent. That's what, what she was saying. Does that make any sense? I mean, you can only go so far with language games, right? You can't change reality. Of course you can. No. Yeah. That, but that's if everybody believes the earth was flat, was it? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. You know what? There's nothing at that point, because look, um, we assume that when we don't perceive that forest, it still remains the same, right? That my fingers will always, are always the same. But if we would... I mean, it depends on how seriously we take it, but if there is a reality that we simply cannot perceive, then there's really nothing we can say about it, right? So maybe it's the same, maybe it isn't. We feel like it's the same, and if we want to maintain that it's the same, we need a universal consciousness. But if we're willing to go complete skepticism, as David Hume would have and many others, um, then we don't need God, but what we're giving up is the order and the consistency of the world, and that's scary. <laughs> that's right. So, so we basically have to live with it. So that's the cost. So I'm, I'm willing to go there, but it's, it's a price. Are we willing to pay that price? Fred. That's the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I actually have a question. Okay. So who perceives God? Well, it perceives, depends on what you mean by perceive. Well, if God has to perceive this reality for us to understand it and, and, and know it. Right. Be it. So who perceives God to perceive this reality? So um, everybody perceives the ideas of God, or at least some of them. So for example, this, this microphone, this, this cup, is being perceived by God, because even if I don't perceive it, it still exists, whatever. So I can't change it into you know, a Big Mac by looking at it. So I'm, I can perceive one of God's ideas. Now, does this mean I'm perceiving God, or I'm only perceiving one of God's ideas? Again, that might be semantically frivolous, I don't know. But basically, everybody who perceives anything that is not their own daydreams is perceiving some aspect of God. Oh, no, no, I'm, I meant it, God exists to perceive so that we can perceive reality. 
who perceives God to ex- for God to exist. Oh, I see. Oh, well, so the God himself perceives himself. Just as we perceive ourselves. If I went to an isolation tank and let's say for whatever reason God wasn't around, I guess, and just, it's just my mind, um, maybe if I'm dreaming, I create realities that only I perceive, um, I still perceive myself. Um, that's one of the other things that Descartes meant when he said, I think, therefore I am, is I directly perceive my own existence. And so God would perceive himself, his, his, herself, itself, whatever. Okay. I know. I don't buy it. I know, I know, I can tell. Like, a lot of people don't want to, and again, we don't necessarily have to reach all these conclusions, but if we start from point A to point B, we, we can get off the train at some point, but there's going to be a cost associated with whatever stop we get off on. It's highly metaphorical, but, um, you know. Any other questions? Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, well, first, I just want to say thank you, because this was, this was really cool. Well, thank you. Opened up my mind. <laughs> and um, so my question is, if we're allowed to know all of this this far, why can't we know, like, everything? Like, because we, I don't know how to explain it. Like, we can only think so far into this. If he's giving us all this and letting us think so far into mm-hmm. this, why can't we just know it all, you know? I, I think I know what you mean. And if I don't, if my answer doesn't address your con- question, we'll come back. Um, I think it's because human beings are fallible and we should not be playing with certain toys. Um, <laughs> right? If, if everything is a matter of perception, we could control our perceptions too. I mean, we can control some of God's ideas. We can mine ore and we can turn it into swords or into plows. And, you know, God will give us some free will or whatever if you want to buy that. But there are some things that we simply can't do. I can't shoot lightning bolts out of my, my fingers like the emperor from Star Wars. Because the human mind is undisciplined and we have crazy thoughts that we probably shouldn't be having, but they randomly cross. Um, have you ever been, this is going to be on talking about, have you ever been at, um, like, maybe at the grocery store or at Starbucks or something, and maybe you're behind a policeman, right, police officer, and you, and you look at their gun, right? And you're like, I could grab that gun. <laughs> right, now, thank you for laughing because I'm not, and like, I know this in my classes, everybody's like, oh, my God, I thought the same thing. Or sometimes I'll be talking to someone, and someone I love, and I'm like, I could just slap them right in the face. Like, <laughs> ah, that one got you. All right, so we've all been there. Look. I don't suggest grabbing an officer's gun. That's not going to end well, okay? And I don't suggest slapping your loved ones in the face either. The point is that we have these random thoughts because the human mind is undisciplined. And if every single thing we thought became manifest, the world would be horrible. It's bad enough, you know, making, be, beating our uh, plowshares into swords, right? So what God does is he limits our ability so that we can grow, so that we can have a little bit of the power of creation, but that every random thought we have doesn't become reality. So does that address the concern that you have? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. We have, I think, one more question over here. Do we have time, Carol? Oh, yeah. Okay. Are you sure? Never mind. Okay. <laughs> kind of the same question, but more serious. Are you sure? Like, I need more than the answer right now. Okay. Fantastic. Ah, oh, good. That's why I answered it preemptively. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but we do have a question. Hello. Hello. Um, so earlier you said um, you, God manifests the, what we perceive, right? Uh, to the most, yeah, um, mostly. What we perceive that we cannot control with our own mind, God manifests. Okay, so we couldn't perceive something that was um, not possible. So like you said, we couldn't, we couldn't shoot lightning out of our fingers like the Emperor from Star Wars, right? Thank God. Okay, yeah. Literally so, and metaphorically. Now, we can't do that, but what if we created something or thought of something. And so we, we perceive that, but God didn't necessarily give us that presumption. You know, he didn't manifest that object. Well, we, but we see, it. and so now I'm just going to start to maybe, some people don't want to necessarily believe in this God, so maybe I'm going to give you some ammunition here. He does perceive that because when that metal ore, whatever it is that I turn into a sword or mm-hmm. into a lightning shooting gauntlet device or whatever it is that we've made that can do things, God has to perceive the integrity of that metal. Like God is perceiving the chair that you're sitting on right now. And if God didn't perceive the chair, it would disintegrate and you, know, you might fall through it if you're worried about falling through it, suddenly you can't. Which means that if I 
manifest something. If I construct some device and I use it to hurt people, like if I make an ax and instead of chopping down trees, I, I murder somebody with an ax, God must be maintaining the integrity of that ax as I'm swinging it, which means God is party to the evil that I am and performing, which means God cannot be a perfectly good God if he's become, if he's aiding and abetting my, you know, axe murderosity, I don't think that's a word, axe murderitude, I'm not really sure. That. So I don't know if this addresses your question. I mean, the short answer is God is actually perceiving at least the integrity of the, the physical substrate, physical substrate, but that doesn't, that doesn't actually help the concept of a good God. So again, I'm not, I never said his name was Jesus. I said his name was Universal Consciousness, and he's kind of a jerk. <laughs> Any other questions? So. Infinite, <laughs> infinite <laughs> turtles all the way down? Yeah. No. I mean, look, we could, I mean, I do, although this might actually cause another discussion. Um, it's basically the Kalam cosmological argument that an actual infinite is impossible because the concept of infinity made manifest leads to contradictions. Therefore, it's an impossibility. Therefore, the universe can't be infinite. Therefore, there must have been a beginning in time. Well, that you know, the matter was infinite, yeah. but that it was just eternal, that it was always here. <laughs> so this is a different kind of discussion. Yeah, this is a good one. You're, you're gearing me up, man. I don't know. If we, I can't do it. What do we got, like one minute? I don't think I can do it. Yeah, I mean, I will talk. I know where your office is. We'll talk. We'll have to have Fred part two. Ah. Anyone else? Is that, is that good? Did I take too long? Was the timing no, right good. on the presentation? I, I zipped through some stuff, but we good? Fantastic. All right. Well, listen, thank you guys all for coming out. I'm sorry that. Thank you. Sorry about the snow. I appreciate that.